So my name is Christina Colon Semenza, and I want to thank you all for joining us here this afternoon. I am a physical therapist and a research scientist at the Center for Neuro Rehabilitation. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how to stay motivated for physical activity while social distancing during the COVID-19 pandemic. So prior to all of this, you likely had a great exercise program. Maybe you were going to your local gym or fitness center, involved in a boxing class and going regularly and getting in a great workout. Maybe you had an exercise group, a walking group, a running group that you were meeting with on a regular basis to get your physical activity in every week. Or maybe you were getting your physical activity by getting out and meeting with friends and family, going out to dinner, going out to movies or social gatherings with those that you love. Or maybe your physical activity was gained by running errands, going to the supermarket, going to the bank, going to the pharmacy. And unfortunately, now all of that has changed. We are all staying home to save lives and to stay safe. So now what? Yes, we must stay home. We must help to do our part to save lives. And a great way to do that is by staying healthy, by keeping ourselves as healthy as possible. And physical activity and exercise is one way to support our health. So by staying physically active, we can do our part. Unfortunately, often our environments are not set up to support our exercise and physical activity. We have computers and laptops that keep us seated and engaged for hours on end. We have televisions, tablets, smartphones that keep us sitting and not moving. So it's a challenge for everyone to stay active and, and physically moving in order to stay healthy. Unfortunately, for those individuals with Parkinson's disease, there's an added challenge. The disease process itself actually affects our drive, our motivation, the ability to say yes to effort, the ability to plan and execute those plans are affected by the disease process. But the good news is that with a plan, that with some help, with some guidance, we can combat these things that are keeping us sedentary. And the first step in that plan is to think about what motivates you. What is it that defines you? What is it that you value? Is it family? Is it that you really value your family and your role in that family? That you consider yourself to be a caregiver within your family or a financial provider or the unifier in your family? Is it that you really value your independence that you've worked so long and hard to create this home that you want to stay in? Is it that you really value your career or your job, that that defines who you are as a person and what is so important to you? Or is it your involvement in your faith community, a nonprofit organization in your community? Is it that you are highly involved in a social movement that you want to continue your involvement in? I want you to consider this. How do you define yourself? What do you value? What is so important to you? Because when you think about this, and tie this to your exercise and physical activity and how staying physically active will support you to continue being who you are and who you want to continue to be. This will drive your motivation. So it's one thing to say, I'm going to be, yes, I'm going to be physically active. Yes, I'm going to engage in my exercise program so that I can be all that I can be, so I can continue to participate as an active member in my family, in my community, at my job. But it takes something more than just thinking about that very broadly and non-specifically. It requires a SMART goal. And what is a SMART goal? A SMART goal needs to be specific, it needs to be measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. So we're going to go through some examples in order to outline these a little bit more. So here's an example. Maybe you were that individual who was getting a lot of their physical activity by getting out and engaging in your community, going food shopping, meeting up with friends, 
um, but you didn't really have a strong exercise plan. Well, I would recommend that you look back on last week's webinar that Tammy DeAngelis did that introduces you to the Be Active and Beyond booklet. And Tammy introduced three exercises, the squat, heel raises, and calf stretches. These are three basic easy exercises. And your goal for this week might be, I will do those three exercises that Tammy introduced from the booklet. I'm going to do them in the family room every day this week to increase my strength and flexibility so that I can continue to babysit for my grandchildren. So this is specific because it's saying what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, which days you're going to do it, and it is measurable because you know that you're going to check each day of the week, have I done this? Is it relevant? Yes, because you define yourself as a caregiver. You have an important role to play in your family taking care of your grandchildren. And it is time bound because again, at the end of that week, seven days, you're gonna check off and say, how did I do? Another example might be, you were a person who was getting out, who was going to all those exercise classes and you can no longer go to those. So maybe now you are cycling at home on a stationary bike. So your goal might be, I will cycle on my stationary bike after reading the news and drinking my morning coffee for 30 minutes at a moderate intensity on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of this week. And you're going to do this to reduce your leg stiffness and to be able to continue your work as a carpenter. So this is, again, it's specific. It says what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, when you're going to do it. It's measurable. You can see, did you do your 30 minutes at a moderate intensity? It is relevant because you really want to reduce that leg stiffness and you want to continue your work as a carpenter. And it is time bound, again, because this is your one week goal. I skipped over achievable, but now we're going to come back to that point. When you are creating your goal, I want you to ask yourself, how confident am I that I can achieve this goal? And think about this on a scale of zero out of 10, where zero means not confident at all, and 10 means I am completely confident. If when you create this goal, if you're scoring your confidence to be an eight or greater, perfect. You are setting yourself up for success. If you're lacking in that confidence, revise that goal. It's okay to start with a SMART goal. Revise that goal so you are feeling very confident that you will be able to achieve this in the time period that you've set. Setting the smaller goals and increasing your confidence will help you to stick with it over the long term. So, okay, great. You're thinking about your values, who you are, what's important to you, what defines you. You've created this SMART goal that is very specific and measurable, but it doesn't stop there. You need to now have feedback on that goal. So you've established this goal, but how are you going to know if you've achieved it or not? Well, there are some low-tech solutions. You can simply type up a schedule or handwrite a schedule and put it on the front of the refrigerator that says on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm going to do my stationary biking, or Monday through Friday, I'm going to do those three exercises. So you can have this low-tech way to keep track, or you can go the high-tech route and use an activity tracker that will show you um, through an app whether or not you have achieved those goals. So low tech or high tech, it doesn't matter. You just need to have feedback on those goals so that at the end of the time period that you've set, you can say, yes, I did my cycling on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday this week. Great. And that is setting up a rewarding environment, which brings me to my next point. So you have defined who you are and what you value. You have set that SMART goal that is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And now you need to make sure that these goals are rewarding to help keep you motivated over the long term. So sometimes just having that check off on your sheet can be a reward in and of itself. By using technology, for example, our activity trackers that have fireworks that go off when we've achieved our 10,000 goals, it can be as simple as that. Um, giving yourself a gold star at the end of the week for doing what you set out to do. Another way to have rewards to help keep us motivated for exercise and physical activity is a social reward. And you might have already experienced this when going to your exercise classes with your peers and your friends is just seeing them or them saying, hey, great job today, Joe, you worked so hard, or I really see your progress. 
So there's evidence from the literature that having someone else engaged in your plan of action helps to keep you motivated. So the question is, how do we do that now that we're supposed to be socially distancing? How can we have social support? So we actually did a study looking at this with completely virtual interactions. We matched individuals with Parkinson's disease. We had them speak over the phone once a week for eight weeks. They set together these SMART goals that were very specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And they were also given a Fitbit and they, were, they became Fitbit friends on the Fitbit app. So they could see each other's progress. They could get that feedback. And in fact, we saw that yes, people were able to become more active when they were set up for success by having that SMART goal, by having rewards, getting feedback, having social support. And this was done completely virtually by chatting on the phone once a week and by seeing each other's progress via technology. So although our typical means of getting social support, whether it's through optimism walks or through our exercise classes um, or our exercise groups, these things have changed, but that doesn't mean that we still can't have social support while socially distancing during this COVID-19 pandemic. So some examples of things that I've done with my family is we've been having Zoom meetings. So we get together and we share our successes and our challenges. This is a multi-generational meeting with my siblings, my parents, my nieces and nephews, and we're all getting together and sharing our challenges and difficulties in living in these times. So this is a perfect way for you to share with loved ones how you're doing with your physical activity plan and goals. This can also be done during typical, via social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, however you like to engage with the world, online social support groups um, to help engage others in your exercise and physical activity plan. An even more simplistic way might just be getting on the phone or via text message. So for example, I've been engaging with my parents about their physical activity and their goals. You can see in this interaction with my dad, he is there down in Florida and he said, we did 35 minutes of walking. It was very humid temperature. And I was saying, that's great, dad. Thank you. I'm so glad that you guys were able to get out and walk even though it was hot and humid. And then I'm sharing back with them. I also did my two mile run and now I'm doing yard work. So this is a simple and easy way to maintain social connection and social support for your exercise and physical activity. So many of us are trying to support each other and don't know how to do that. So if you have people in your social network, in your community who are saying, hey, how can I support you? How can I help you? You can say, you know what? This week I have this goal of exercising three times a week. Can you check in on me on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? Send me a text and ask me if I've done that. And that helps to keep you accountable to your goal and to others within your social support network. So, what I hope you will take home with you at this point is that you can't just have a general plan or a general idea of, yeah, I'm going to be more active. You need to be specific about it. So create that SMART goal. You also need to have feedback on these goals, whether it is low tech or high tech. Try to create that rewarding environment by creating some sort of checkoff system, giving yourself a star, using technology to get points or fireworks, something that is going to keep you sticking with it. And then get that social support, even though we're socially distancing and keeping ourselves stay safe by staying home, you can still connect through technology, either the phone, social media, uh, virtual meetings, stay connected, and that will help you to stick with your goals. So I'll remind everyone, as APDA always says, that we need to have strength and optimism and hope in progress. And remember that a goal without a plan is just a wish. So make those SMART goals and create that plan. If you need help in getting started with creating that goal, we are available to help you. The Be Active and Beyond booklet is available for free download through the APDA and you can see the website available right here. In addition, we have the APDA exercise helpline that we run through Boston University's Center for Neurorehabilitation. 
You can call us at this number or you can email us. We are here to help you. We can help you to uh, re create that SMART goal and get started on a great plan to stay motivated for exercise and physical activity. So with that, I will ask Tammy DeAngelis to join us, who will be helping to moderate questions regarding how to stay motivated for exercise and physical activity. Welcome, Tammy. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Christina. Okay, we have, um, we're waiting for some questions. We have some that were submitted ahead of time, Christina. Also, I wanted to just note some people are reminding about the optimism walk the APDA optimism walks that are happening all over. Um, again, if we would be walking separately, but together, but they're a virtual event. So you can check out um, in Massachusetts, it's happening on May 31st. And um, you can go on to the APDAparkinson.org optimism walk to find out where others are taking place. So, when so that's great. Place. So even though we're not able to typically gather the way that we're used to, we're making changes in our routines to stay safe, stay healthy, but still stay motivated and moving. Yes. And awesome. Yes. Yep. Great. Thank you, Bill and Eloise for mentioning that. All right. So I have a question for you. Yes. My, my legs are weak and balance needs work. What can I do other than walk? I walk freely out of doors. Okay. So excellent. So great job continuing with your walking and what can you do to get your, to improve your balance and improve your strength, I would highly recommend that you check out our Be Active and Beyond booklet. Within the booklet, it does a great job of separating out all of the different sections of exercise, strength, balance, and endurance exercises. So yes, your walking is helping to keep you moving and it is definitely working on endurance and some strength, but there are specific strength and balance exercises that you can find in that booklet that are simple, they are, the booklet was created to be done solely at home. So you can do this completely at home and you can um, be able to progress it. So we have tiers of the exercises. So you can start off at level one and progress to level two. So that Be Active and Beyond booklet is a great resource. Great, thank you, Christina. I have another question that came to us. So. My father is retired and 75 years old. He has never been an exerciser. I send him all the articles about how important exercise is for Parkinson. He agrees that it's important, but he never follows through on actually doing the exercises on his own. I am so frustrated. What can I do? So that's a great question. Um, thank you for that question. And so I think this is a common one that individuals get frustrated, but I would ask this individual to keep in mind that sometimes a lack of motivation is a symptom of the disease. So keeping that in mind though, there are things that can be done. So there might need to be an external cue. So if, if her dad or his or her dad has the, um, has the information that exercise is important, but isn't doing things on his own, then he might need that external cue to get started. So whether it's a call, a text, or, or a person actually going and getting him started on his exercise. Another thing that can be really helpful is having a routine that is always established for her dad to engage in exercise. So helping him to get started with, with that routine through a family member or a fitness professional can help him to get started with that routine. And then once that routine is established, habits will set in and then it's not even a question. Then he's doing it just the same way he brushes his teeth every day. Um, he would be engaging in exercise and physical activity because it would be an established habit. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question coming in um, from Marlene. What type of exercise helps prevent leg cramps? So thank you, Marlene, for that question. So yes, so there are a whole bunch of causes of leg cramps. So um, it's, I would ask that individual to definitely speak with their healthcare provider to investigate some other potential causes of those leg cramps. But exercises that can easily support that is keeping blood flow going through the calf and the feet. So by doing some simple ones such as ankle pumps, ankle circles, writing the alphabet with your, with your toes and your feet can help to get the blood flow going, help to keep things loose and flexible, and help to minimize those leg cramps. Yep, good. We get another question coming in and it's um, from William Roberts. So the question is, what can I do to help breathing? 
um, I can <laughs> I can tackle that. We could I could also share, and I'll I'll pass it to you. But um, one of the it this is a tricky problem, and um, one that we could if you if you contact our helpline, it might be we can give you specific information um, and find out a little bit more about specifically what you're going through. But Christina, do you have any general tips for people who are limited by freezing? So yes, so this is definitely a common problem that individuals living with Parkinson's disease are, are dealing with. So we have some tips and tricks up our sleeve that we can help individuals to deal with this, whether it's distraction, thinking about something else, or having cues in the environment that help you to get out of that freeze, such as having simple tape on the floor or other markings, or sometimes even envisioning something else to help you take that first step and get out of the freeze. But as Tammy indicated, this is something that we can work with you um, in physical therapy, or even if you call our helpline, we might be able to give you some simple tips and tricks for your individual case. Yep, or email our helpline too at rehab at bu.edu. Uh, we have another question. Do you have any tips on fitting exercise into my schedule once I go back to work? Yeah, that's a great one. Thank you so much for that question. So absolutely. So it might seem easier now that we are all working from home and have this extra time on our hands when our commutes are eliminated and some of those things uh, that we're normally restricted with getting in the way. However, still creating that plan of action, planning it out, scheduling it out. I have individuals tell me that when I say to myself, I am going to go during my lunch break, even if it's just for a 10 minute walk, and then I'm going to park as far back as possible so that I'm getting in that extra physical activity. So building in physical activity during your day is one way to tackle it. And then the second way is to schedule it, to make it a part of your day. The same way you make brushing your teeth and taking your shower a required part of your day, think of exercise as a requirement for that part of the day and schedule it ahead of time and make sure that you're protecting that time that this is my exercise time. And even though I have other things on my agenda for that day, this is a priority. So making sure that you're scheduling will help you to stick with it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, here's a good question. And this is a common one we hear too. Um, how is important is it to follow a Parkinson's specific exercise program? So one designed for people with Parkinson's versus just a regular fitness program that I might be able to find online. So that's a great question. Thank you for that question. So there is a lot of research that helps us to understand and guide how to prescribe exercise for people with Parkinson's disease. So we know that higher intensity exercise is especially beneficial for people with Parkinson's disease. So that is a key component. And also when working with a physical therapist, a physical therapist will be able to evaluate your strength, your balance, your range of motion, all of your levels of um, impairments or abilities, and then be able to exactly tailor your program for your needs. So yes, you might think that um, having a general exercise program is appropriate for you, maybe in the early stages of the disease process, but actually what we find when evaluating people who even they themselves are not noticing any def deficits, physical therapists are able to pick up on these early signs and, and um, impairments and then target an exercise program for individuals early on so that these impairments are either eliminated or made to stay at a plateau. So I can see the um, maybe the desire to just kind of pick up any exercise program, but I would highly recommend that you engage a physical therapist early on in the disease process so that you can have a program that is tailored exactly to your needs and your abilities. Okay, it's sort of a follow-up question. So if I were to look for a yoga class, is it important that I take a yoga class that is specifically for people with Parkinson's or can I just go on YouTube and find a regular yoga class? So again, I would highly recommend that when engaging with exercise classes online, that you are seeking out information regarding that instructor. So through the APDA and along with the Center for Neurorehabilitation, we have established a program for fitness professionals. And this educates fitness professionals on how to understand Parkinson's disease and how to tailor exercise for their needs. 
So it's not that necessarily a general yoga program would be um, problematic. It's just that one that is tailored towards your needs and for a person with Parkinson's disease would be even better. So I would highly recommend that you investigate the credentials of your fitness instructor and ask them if they are, have taken the APDA um, fitness professional training program. And then the program will be more likely tailored to your needs and avoid problems that um, might increase uh, problems for people with Parkinson's disease. Okay, great, thank you, Christina. All right, so we have time for one more question and I think we'll move to introducing our next week's speaker, Teresa Baker. Um, so the last question I have is, can I still meet with my friends to go for a walk, walk at our local park? So yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that I've even been asking myself. I had a regular running group that I was participating in with some of my friends. And the Center for Disease Control is recommending that individuals who do not reside together do not gather together. So yes, we are still encouraging individuals to get out and exercise and walk and run, do those things outdoors, but do them only with individuals who you are residing with and maintaining that six feet or two meters distance from others in the environment. So unfortunately for now, that walking group needs to start. You can do it virtually like the optimism walks are doing where you are conversing with each other either on the phone or via FaceTime, but walking separately. Okay, great, thank you. So now I think we'll have um, Teresa join us. Teresa there. Oh, all right. <laughs> then we oh, will. Tammy, I'm I'm here, oh, just yeah, a little yeah. slow. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Well, um, do you want to just tell us quickly how you, what you'll be talking about next week? Yes, certainly. And thank you, Christina. Thank you, Tammy. A great, great presentation. Next week, what I'd love to talk about is how to set up your area at home for success with exercise. And so we'll present some ideas and then maybe we can take questions as well. Excellent. Thank you, Teresa. Looking forward to that. Great. Great. All right. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. As always, you can reach us at rehab at bu.edu if you have follow-up questions, and we hope you'll join us next week. Great. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Keep moving. <laughs>